Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. Thank you very much indeed, as always, for being here. Arsenal are back on top of the Premier League table after a 2-0 win over Luton at the Emirates last night. That is going to be the main focus of this particular episode. We'll talk about the game, the goals, some of the individual performances, etc., etc. That's coming right up. And a little later on, I'll be talking to our good friend, Elliot, from the Arsenal Vision podcast, to talk about the fundraiser that they are doing again this year in aid of the Arsenal. Foundation. We'll get some of the details of that. We'll hear a little bit from Leah Williamson as well as part of what's going on there. So that's a little bit later on in the show. For now, though, let's just get straight into it. Arsenal, 2 0 winners over Luton last night. Martin Odegaard with a goal, an own goal just before halftime, giving us the win. Plenty to talk about, plenty to unpack from the performance. And with me to do that, I'm delighted to welcome back. He's the co host of the Stadio podcast. It's Ryan Hun. Hi there. Hey Andrew, how's it going? It's going all right. We're top of the table. You know, this is yeah. this is a good place to be. It might be temporary, in fairness, given the fact that Liverpool are playing Sheffield United tonight, and I, you know, I think there's a reasonable expectation that they might win that game pretty easily. They might win. They might win. But then we had a not quite a similar game last night, but a, a game against a team in the bottom three. I think there is a distinction to be made between Luton Town and Sheffield United in terms of how they've dealt with the Premier League. But it was a 2-0 win to Arsenal. The goals came in the first half and and there was a lot of talk and debate and uh, discussion uh, beforehand about was Mikel Arteta going to rotate? Should he rotate? Uh, Would you be better sticking with the main man and and getting into a commanding lead and, and rest those players? But he made five changes from the team that played Man City. Um... Out went Kivior, Rice. Uh, I do have this in the front of my brain here. I know that. Um, Jorginho. Jorginho, Saka, who wasn't in the squad at all. Gabriel Jesus, out. Mm. In Zinchenko, Partey, Smithrow, Nelson, Trossard. Trossard has been a you know regular, uh, even if he's been a little off the bench here and there, but he has been a regular uh, player. The others, to various extents over the last little while, haven't been. Zinchenko has been out injured for a while. Partey season, you know, is what it is. And, and Smith Rowe is a player who, who you know, really hasn't had a much of a look in over the last little while. Reese Nelson starting his first Premier League game in four years. So it will go some way to explain why, you know, even if the first half was the half in which we got the goals, the performance wasn't quite as fluent as as we've seen from Arsenal in, in previous weeks. Yeah, it's really hard to change that many players and expect the same level of fluidity. Um, I was at the Sheffield United game in, uh, at Bramall Lane in the second half when Arsenal made all that changes. You noticed a huge drop-off in just how mm. how connected everyone seemed to be. And I think that's that's kind of normal. That's why we've ke- seen the same team unchanged for so long and how and you know like a lot of the talk was about Elmo Smith Rowe which I imagine we'll talk about but one of the major reasons why people like him haven't been able to get into the team is because that team has got to know each other really well we and it's evolved in a circum in circumstances that we didn't think it would evolve in you know Kivior at left back for example is a is a major factor um so yeah as soon as I saw the, the team sheet I wasn't expecting another 6-0 mm. or anything like that because I just think it's quite hard to expect that same level of of play when you make when you change half the side but also I, th- I think it was a good move from Arteta because if you look ahead of the to the to the rest of the fixtures there are there just aren't many opportunities to rotate from the start mm. you can hopefully be leading games and rotate or, or rest players take players off but from the start I just think this is probably the last chance for a while that that's going to happen. Yeah. So, yeah, understood it. Was quite encouraged by some of the performances as well. I know Emma Smith-Rowe got player of the match and um, got a lot of the, the plaudits, but I actually thought Reese Nelson was, was quietly quietly good. That's interesting. Um, that's interesting because I, you know, I looked at the stats this morning and I saw Reese Nelson 100% pass completion. Yeah. And I saw a guy who did his defensive duty, who was diligent, yep. chasing back, et cetera, et cetera. But 
I also saw a guy who, if you know, we were without Bakayo Saka for any period of time, I wouldn't have a great deal of faith in him being able to contribute no. going forward. And I'm, I'm, I'm slightly sort of. I don't want to go hard on him because it was his first start in four years. I think you have to acknowledge that when a player is starting his first game in the Premier League for four years, regardless of who else is around, whether it's Bakayo Saka, Gabriel Martinelli, Gabriel Jesus, you recognize there's a measure of competition, but you have to acknowledge that there's probably a good reason for that, which is more about the individual. So I don't want to go hard on him. He hasn't played a lot of minutes. I think he was tidy. He yeah, probably, tidy is the good word. Yeah. He probably did exactly what Mikel Arteta asked him to do, yeah. which was which was probably to be a little conservative. Just get yeah. in there, deputize for Saka, help Ben White when Ben White needs a bit of help, and don't take any unnecessary risks. But but in the sort of wider context of of. Uh, how we see this team going forward, there's always talk about, well, the team has moved beyond this player, right? The team has moved beyond I was Kieran. I talk about this. It's Kid- the Arsenal buzzword, of the, of the it, buzz phrase, isn't it? It is. Teams moved beyond. I mean, but, but that's part of progression and development, yeah. right? And it's inevitable, and it's not necessarily a criticism of a player if we say, well, the way the team plays now no longer suits someone like Kieran Tierney, so he's gone on loan, and, and, you know, I've got a left-back discussion to have with you now in a few minutes anyway. But I think as well, somebody like Reese Nelson, when you see him come in, as tidy as he was, I think you recognize as well that when you're looking for the team to evolve further, whether in phase four or phase five of where Arteta wants us to be, elevating the floor of the squad, those sort of, those squad players like Nelson, like Eddie and Kedia, yeah. this is where I think, this is how you do it. With all due respect to those guys, it's it's replacing them with somebody who can give you a little bit more. Yeah, Joe, I, I don't know if you remember when we had our chat, I think it was in January, we were talking about signings mm. and I said a wide forward but who could contribute in goals and this is yeah. for this very reason because I feel like it it gives us a little bit more flexibility in that front line and I actually really like Reese Nelson and I think the reason I like Reese Nelson is because he will come in for a game like this and just be tidy which is actually really really important in a home game against Luton when you need to rest players and you're going for a title it's really, really important. And you don't want your winger who's coming in for, you know, one of the best players that we have to be thinking, okay, this is my time to shine. It's tricks and flicks time. I'm going to turn over the ball and we're going to be running back to our own goal all the time. This and actually, it, I think yeah. that, that the reason that I kind of went for him first is because I actually think that takes a huge amount of discipline. And discipline is... You know, it's not it's, it's not the it's not the reason we all get into football. I don't think just just love the disciplined nature of performances. Yeah, but um, <laughs> that's a really that's a really selfless thing to do, actually. And I think for you know wingers notoriously lacking in ego. So uh, mm. you know, I think uh, that's why I wanted to kind of go for him first. Sure. I also think it was something that you saw in Emil Smith Rowe's play as well. Him. I, sh- I wonder whether his lack of uh, game time has, has actually been his fault or whether it's actually Arteta trying to figure out where he can put him. Because the Emma Smith throw that we saw last night, I don't know if it's too quick to transition onto him, but um, I, th- I found it int- really interesting because early on in the game, I'd actually thought he looked a little bit off the pace. Mm-hmm. And he really grew into the game in a very impactful way. And that was really impressive, but him putting more of a shift in being disciplined and because he is actually like a low key, quite a big guy. Emil Smith row. Mm. I think he's actually bigger than he looks and operating in that other eight role in midfield. I think last night was the first time I really thought, Oh, actually I could see a future for him in that position as opposed to like a floaty number 10, which we all thought he was yeah. or coming in off the wide, off the, yeah. off the, off the wing. Sorry. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk about Smith Rowe now. We might as well, but just sort of going back to, to the Nelson thing. I mean, mm. it is that balance of, you know, you, you're being asked to come in and do a job as a forward player. I think there is a, 
some measure of like, okay, let's try and make something happen here. On the other side, Trossard, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe not as restricted in terms of the instructions that he got from the manager, was willing to take his man on a bit, willing to have a go, try and get beyond him, try and get across him. We didn't see any of that from Reese Nelson. It could all be tied into, um, you know, what he was asked to do or what he feels comfortable doing, having had so little playtime. So, yeah, I do think there is that balance there. But, you know, when you when you give players a chance and when you give them an opportunity in the first team, you kind of want them to lean into their strengths just a little bit. And I don't mm. know that he necessarily did that. And, and as I said, it's not really a huge criticism because that, yeah. he didn't give anything away. Conversely, we could be sitting here this morning talking about, well, he was so wasteful. He kept getting caught in possession. He kept trying to dribble past his man, you know, and he's getting pelters for that, which might, you know, tie into some of the uh, discussion we have around left back and some of the, the issues there. Um, but on Smith Row, I think you're, I think you're right. You know, that, the game, or he grew into the game in quite a significant way. And it's also worth bearing in mind that he hasn't really played a lot of football in that position Not for all, Arsenal. Right. You know, he played where Odegaard played quite a bit. He played out on the left-hand side. His best football for Arsenal probably came when he played out on, on the left-hand side. And look, that role, what's expected from the player in that role in this team right now is very different from when Emil Smith-Rowe was played out there. So... There's a comfort zone element to 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 his performance, right? In that he, he's slightly out of it. He's being put right in a very very um, sort of like the fulcrum of that that attacking triangle, and being asked to contribute and make decisive decisions and make decisive moments in the game, which I think he did in that first half. Although it took him a while to get into it, he was involved in the first goal, won the ball high up the pitch very well, good tackle. Um, you know, not something you normally associate with him, but he won the ball, gave it to Odegaard, Odegaard to Havertz, Havertz back to Odegaard. It's a lovely, lovely finish from, really from the goal. skipper. But I think as, as you know, I was talking to somebody before the game saying, wouldn't it be brilliant if Smith Rowe got a goal, you know, got himself on the score sheet. But I think in some ways, maybe winning a duel, which yep. we know Mikel Arteta loves, winning a duel, creating the transition and enabling... Havertz and Odegaard to combine for the goal is, I'm not going to say it's better for him, but perhaps in the eyes of the manager, that's a contribution that he can look at and say, ah, okay. I think it really is better for him, actually. I think it's way better for him than being a little bit on the fringe of the game and maybe popping up with a goal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think yeah. like, you know, when people look at it, well, he got a goal, so he had a great game or, you know, but yeah. I, I think in the eyes of the manager. With the manager, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I think but I think also it's really important for us, I think, if we're going to talk about this to to try and push that point, because I think it was a problem with the Harvards thing early on in the season that it was all just two goals and assisty. And um, I think what's really cool for Emil smith is like you say, people keep talking about how this team is seemingly moving on from everyone and actually... Can they keep up? And I think this was a really good sign, actually, that Emil Smith Rowe can uh, develop his game or evolve his game to actually stay completely relevant to this mm. team. You know, like with the second goal as well, that's something that will Arteta will love. You know, two very different decisive actions that led to two goals, and in different ways. And yeah, I think I think you, you can't really ask for for more from a player who hasn't played a lot of football and all, and clearly like in the post match interviews was very keen to stress that it's been a really difficult season, mm. um, which I think we all maybe could understand. You know, was the thing of, was it away at Bournemouth when he missed that chance and everyone was a little bit worried about him because he looked really really upset mm. and uh, yeah, just good to see him playing football. It's nice to see. It's just. From a purely romantic point of view as well, it's just really nice to see an Arsenal number 10 just kind of like being really involved. You yeah, know? I agree. And I think, you know, another aspect to this is that there was another option for Mikel Arteta in that we have a £30 million signing on the bench in Fabio Vieira who could have played in that position. You know, there were other decisions that Mikel Arteta could have made which... um you know, might have seen Smith Rowe start on the bench. So there was an element of, okay, let's see, this is Luton. It is a chance to rest players. It is a chance to rotate players, but it's also a chance to see what I can get out of some players 
with a view to seeing what else they can contribute in the run-in and where they can contribute uh, as well. So, you know, he could have played Vieira in there. He could have dropped Havertz back in there and started Eddie and Kedia, or maybe Gabriel Jesus up front, or he could have played Trossard up front and Martinelli from the left, but he decided to go with Smith Rowe. And I think, mm. you know, that moment where he kind of sparked into life and really sparked for the rest of the second, I think the goal was 24, 25th minute, there was a brilliant chance for him set up by just at a little wiggle of the feet by Martin Odegaard. I've gone back to look at it over and over again, and it's, it's just so sort good. of like he just sort of waggles his feet and sends yeah. the ball into the path of Smith Rowe. Keeper made a good save. And then that second goal, which I think you know was probably quite an important goal in the context mm. of what came in the second half, you can see him on the edge of the box. He sees the space. He goes into the space and he's aware of, you know, when we talk about, you know, players who haven't been in the team much, players who who haven't combined much, I think he's aware that if he makes that run, Trossard is going to make the pass. The other thing I like about this second goal is that rather than just play it back first time, he takes it on a bit. Yeah. And you know, whether you call it the corridor of uncertainty or just the fucking whatever, just you put it in a in a in an area where a deflection can make it either a goal for Reese Nelson, uh, who was in there, or the uh, the own goal. But I like the fact that he didn't just sort of get there, pull it back, bit hit and hope. He took it on, and there was a sort of um, a deliberate decision to put it into a, the most dangerous area he could put it into. Very Martinelli esque, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. Good point. Because Martinelli always, you always, he always kind of seems to just hold on a little bit, delay the delay the um, release, and kind of put it into that area. Mm. But yeah, no. Again, really impressive. I just, I think that that again, like we were talking about how disciplined Reese Nelson it was, and it, how it could have been tricks and flicks and stuff like that. Again, I think the same thing could have been said for Emil Smith Rowe and I think that to show that level of composure um that that sometimes takes reps you know that's sometimes you can be a bit Mm -hmm. kind of snatchy with chances or passes or you know be a bit too eager to impress when you haven't started for a while and again I think that that he's he Musa on Stadio I think once said that he's the he's the Premier League player who looks like he's most just having a kickabout in the park in a good way, mm. Emil Smith Rowe, because he kind of just looks. I, I I I think I said something like I imagine that Cruyff would have loved him in a way because he never looks like he's in a hurry. Sure, and that's like a kind of thing that you know Cruyff always used to go on about. And I think that's such a that's such a cool thing to watch when a player like that is in full flow because it just seems almost effortless. And I think that sometimes almost uh, kind of doesn't really do any, him any favours in the sense of body language and people think he could be, you know, trying more and all this kind of stuff. Mm. But I actually just think that that's just the way he plays. And in instances like that where you have to really like delay the pass, take an extra touch in a really congested a- congested area and show some composure, that kind of level of calm and just almost like you, you can only really play like that if you if you believe in your ability into like a really, really high level. Sure. And I think that, that that was a really good example of that. And again, like a very different involvement to the first goal, you know. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, the, the most impressive thing is that he, sh- he, sh- he showed a really wide range of like midfield abilities and he hasn't started for ages. Like, yeah. Yeah, just really happy for him in that. Yeah, same. Well. And Arteta was very effusive in his praise for him afterwards. Um and I, I suppose if we've got our glasses half full this morning, we're looking at it as, well, this is a test in some ways mm. from Arteta to Smith Rowe, which I think he came through and passed very well. Um, involved in both goals. I think it will be a uh, a confidence boost for him. And he's a yeah. player, I think, that when you're... When you think about the run-in and when you think about how tight some of these games might be and you think about players who you can bring off the bench who might be able to just get themselves in a position where they're going to create something or have a shot, he's pretty high on that list and always has been for me because of the ability that we've seen from him in the past. I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't expect him to start last night. I didn't think he would be in the in the conversation for a start when I thought about how Arteta might change the team. 
you know, it's probably um, a consequence of just not having seen him a lot this season. And you draw inferences from that, from team selections. They tell you a lot about how a manager thinks about a player. So maybe, you know, even if it was, in inverted commas, only Luton, the fact that Arteta did give him this chance is an indication that maybe the the door for Emil Smith Rowe is, you know, is a bit more ajar than it might be for a couple of others. Yeah, I also think we've we've um, struggled to to understand fully how Mikel Arteta would rotate this season because we haven't had a huge amount of, of chances to do so. Went mm. out of both cups early, and every game since then has just felt super important. Even the ones away, um, you know, where we got those big away wins. So, I think it's been more difficult to you know to guess how Arteta would rotate I, I was surprised to see five changes last night because mm. that seems quite wild from an Arteta point of view to I, I thought maybe he would have rotated one or two got the game won and then just taken everyone off kind mm. of thing but you can't really ask for for more than that I, I get a little bit nervous when I see that amount of rotation Luton at home that amount of rotation I've watched actually quite a bit of Luton this season and they've been a lot better than their results have, I agree. have suggested, you know. I agree. And um, just a couple of points, I was just like, mm, I'm not sure if this is, uh, like before the game, I was just a bit, you know, a bit like, this is one of those, that it's mm. it's going to be 1-1. It's just, I just knew it was going to be 1-1. For some reason, I had 1-1 <laughs> in my head. Um, but yeah, just really encouraging and really encouraging to see, I think everyone kind of contribute um, all the players who came in like kind of contribute in a way that you, again I think it's we're so used to maybe like trying to trying to analyse how this team might evolve or could evolve or when Arsenal went putting goals away but up, were creating chances and stuff like that. and actually even if they were you know it wasn't perfect last night another clean sheet result at home back to the top of the table, rotated a load of players. Bakayo Saka didn't even make the squad. It's just like, oh, yeah, great, take my money. You know, like, Yeah, 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 no, I understand. You know? I understand. I want to talk about the second half, but, you know, you, the, the, the the discussion about how the team is going to evolve and who we're going to move past yeah. and who gets left behind. There is a, there, we're just going to get the whole there, new squad. There is a finite number of players that you can actually move exactly. on from at yeah, any one period, yeah. you know, in one transfer window. Yeah. It's not like you go, well, we'll just 14 of you, out you go, and we'll bring it, <laughs> you know, we're not Nottingham Forest in that regard, right? Exactly. But I agree with you about Luton. I think there is, you know, there's something to them as a team. There's something to the way Rob Edwards is is managing that team. I think they have grown in... I watched them in the first couple of weeks of the Premier League season and thought, oh, this is this is yeah. too much for them. And I think one of the most impressive things, even if they are still in the bottom three, is how they've come to grips with the Premier League. Yeah. They were beset by injuries last night, loads yeah. and loads of injuries, teenagers on the bench. I, I guess there's an element of us being 2-0 up in that second half, but I thought Luton, to their credit, gave it a good go, had plenty of possession. There were a couple of moments where I think Gabrielle had to make a few more blocks than I would have liked. Yeah, and Probably than he would have liked. Oh, actually, I think he... he no, he would have, he would just like, I'll yeah, fucking block up. everything, bring it on. Like, have, a, <laughs> have a million shots, I'll block them all. I think that's his mindset. But <laughs> I, I have to say that, you know, there's, there's two ways of looking at that second half. Um, one is that we didn't really give them a sniff of goal and Raya didn't have a save to make and it was a very professional way of seeing out a 2-0 win at home, job done, top of the table. This is the kind of win you need at this point of the season. I will say, though, from my own perspective, in that second half, I was I didn't like it. And I'm no, not, I, I, I wasn't wild about it. I did not like it. I was sending texts to people going, I don't like this half. Don't like this half of football. And part of it is because the 2-0 thing. We've been yeah. there, done that, worn that T-shirt, right? Where there's nothing going on. The opposition aren't doing anything. We are in control. But then somehow there's an 83rd minute goal. And then you're like, oh, fuck. And there's five minutes of added time. And you're like, oh, Jesus. You know, another moment. That was sort of nagging at me. All Same. the way through that that second half, and I get it. We were controlled, and we were 
you know, holding them at arm's length, if you will, but the vagaries of football are such that a single moment can completely change how that, I, like, I wasn't in the stadium last night. I can't really speak to the atmosphere, but my sense was that there was just a little bit of, like, in the in the a little bit dull. Yeah, it was dull. Well. Yeah. So I think, I, you know, there was, so I wonder whether people are like, oh, maybe a goal from Luton might liven it up a bit, but it's just, you know, they're kind of like, mm. I don't know, the Larry David gif, like, do I want that? <laughs> Actually, do I want that? Um, no, I, I totally agree with you, but I think uh, also there were one or two chances where I think Arsenal could have done a little bit better in the final thirds mm. and just it would have been a nothing. I think I, I, even Rob Edwards actually said said after the game, and I think this is, again, just why one of the reasons why Rob Edwards has been really impressive this season is that he said, you know, the second half we did really well, we restricted them. Yes, there's an element of them being 2-0 up, which I think is really cool of him just being like, Let, listen, yeah, I know people might say, you know, we're already 2-0 down, mm. but still. And then they didn't get, you know, they didn't get hammered. They didn't get put away. Um, and I do wonder, yeah, whether maybe... <sighs> I don't know. I always, I always think maybe, uh, or, or wonder whether Arteta is is is, kind of, is that um, uh, way inclined to think at two 0 being like, oh, if they get a goal here, I think he just thinks no, this is totally in control, and yeah, let's put Eddie on. And yeah, I, I look, I, yeah. you couldn't blame him, could you? Because Arsenal don't concede very many goals anymore, and I think maybe two four this year. Yeah, maybe came up on maybe two nil now is different from two nil earlier in the season. Maybe that's yeah, yeah, something really we have is, to yeah. acknowledge. And, you know, I think our, our defensive record is such that you, you have to, I think the players didn't look out of their comfort zone or anything like that. It's just, I suppose, the scars of that kind of stuff run oh. deep as a football fan. You know, you don't, it doesn't take much to scratch away at, so, yeah, at those. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, know it, it, it had, like like you say, Evan, uh, Everton, Luton get a goal back and then 90 plus four, a ball bounces up onto someone's arm and it's a penalty. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. We drop two points. And, it's, you know, we all remember, like, losing to Swansea at home on a Monday night, having, you know, losing 1-0 and they have no shots on top. Target. you know it's just it, was, it, was it that takes the flamini young goal was it was that yeah that it one? takes a, it takes a while to yeah to unlearn that you know so i yeah. get it i totally get it even if it was relatively calm kind of now looking looking back at it yeah 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 um you mentioned rob edwards i thought this was really interesting from him i'm going to play a little clip here i think it was james in the press conference who asked him about what it is that makes arsenal such a, a difficult team to play against and and this is what he had to say they give they give no chances away, do they? Really now, you know, to, to the opposition teams, and we saw them against probably the best team. Don't want to upset any Arsenal fans either, but maybe you know, all right, it's up for debate. But against a top top team on the weekend, and they limited City to very little, so they don't give you anything. And then they've just got it's very clear in how they attack, but but it's really difficult to stop as well. They're always there with good numbers, and then they can really suffocate you as well. So, and I think. Maybe they're the one team out of all the three that are fighting at the moment. They can sort of play any game. If it's a physical game, if it's a, a footballing game, if it's a running game, whatever it is, they've got the answer. They've got the, the, the personnel to sort of play any way. Which I think is really interesting to hear from an opposition coach. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a good question, but I think the, the, the answer is fascinating. I also thought it was very interesting to hear... Tom Lockyer, the Luton captain, who yeah. who thankfully is back in, yeah. in good health and was on the sideline for TNT Sports last night, he was talking about Kai Havertz, and he said, the amount of times he did a double movement today where he went short off Ted and Mengi, that span behind, he would have got the ball if it was played to him. It might not get picked up by the cameras, but they're the sort of movements that even if he doesn't get it, he might get the next one. Then he'll keep going and get the next one. Eventually, something will happen with him. When someone works as hard as that, making those selfless runs, then something will fall in the end. And again, I think, you know, a fellow pro looking at the game from pitch side, from pitch level, seeing it in a different way than we see it when we're sitting at home uh, watching on TV, albeit TNT Sports were inflicting a camera angle on us last night, which <laughs> was... Talk about this. <laughs> do you want to talk about it? Because it was like... <laughs> it happened... Well, I actually watched a game not too long ago on the World Feed, the Premier League World Feed, an Arsenal game at home. I can't remember which one it was now. And they had that angle, but they had they only had that angle as the main angle. Yeah, they, this is the the video game camera angle. I think yeah, that, yeah. that Sky Sports you can choose with your red button. You can yeah. watch the video game angle. It's just a wider angle. But I have to say, I found it 
annoying and disconcerting because I was yeah. there was one moment where I think we was it in the first half where we almost scored or it almost just fell for Thomas Partey to score at the back post. Mm. But it, it was on that weird angle. I was like, I've got no clue what happened here. I think with an ordinary yeah. angle, I would have been able to see it. And we saw it eventually with replays, but it was it was quite annoying. Um, I actually did, uh, whenever things like that pop up, uh, I, would, I'd, I'd like to just do a quick Twitter search just to see if it's, just, if it's not just me, you know. <laughs> and uh, my favorite one that I found was, um, if you have a second, where is sure. it? Where is it? What is this woke nonsense camera angle of the Arsenal game right now? <laughs> and I thought if there was ever a tweet to sum up where we are in 2024 in the kind of, you know, the, the culture war <laughs> crossover with sport discourse, it's uh, this camera angle in a Premier League game is woke. There's a, there's a great little cartoon that goes around. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's like everything I don't like is woke. Yeah, this was engine a great David is Squires one the other day. Yeah. It was just XG woke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the camera angle was annoying. Sorry. Let's accept yeah, that the camera angle fine. was annoying. What was the point we were talking about? We were talking about the way Arsenal play, and we were talking oh, yeah, about sorry, you know yeah. the contribution of of someone like Kai Havertz. But I think as well what what Rob Edwards has identified in Arsenal as a team who have a, a measure of adaptability based on either game state or opposition or, you know, what we need to do at a particular moment in time, I think is is really, really interesting. And we all, we obviously talk about the improvements that Mikel Arteta has made and, and, you know, the development of the team. But, you know, at that kind of granular level coming from another Premier League coach, like you don't normally hear... Premier League coaches talk about either their own team or the opposition in that kind of way. Yeah, I mean, they know a lot better than we do. And um, I also think it's just, no matter who you listen to, who play against Arsenal, who analyse Arsenal in a lot of detail, I think as fans, we're always kind of waiting for... I think like we were talking about before, you know, we're kind of still scarred a bit. But I think it's worth actually just you know, standing up a bit and being like, we are, we're really, really, really good. We're really good. This is the best team that I've seen in 20 years, maybe, I, you know, bar maybe the Champions League uh, final team. It's the only one that can really run, run it close. And that's not me being over the top. It's, it's, it's the most complete team I've seen since Arsenal last won the league. Mm. And that's because of the reasons that Rob Edwards is saying, they they don't have um, a certain specific style, the only way that they can play. And this is why I thought that it was quite interesting seeing people talk about the almost Mourinho-esque. There was a few Mourinho where, oh, if Mourinho had done that against City, people would be saying this, that, and the other. And I just mm. think, I get, I, I get why people want to split it down to like a really kind of simple binary argument, but it's just, I never really thought that because the way that Arsenal compact space and then all of a sudden, in an instant, make the pitch huge, I think is so difficult to defend in transition. But also, instead of just having, yeah, Arsenal got four centre-backs playing in the back four on the weekend, but Ben White was a centre-back, essentially, or a centre-back profile playing right back who was Arsenal's most um, uh, attacking outlet mm. against Manchester City away from home. That's not something you get in 2008 you know you just don't get that and again last night I thought he was great he popped up in as like yeah, in the number the, 10 the position kind of number what 10 about, role doing what? tricks and flicks kind Oof. of thing um, Oof. being like listen Reese, if you're not going to do if you're going to be disciplined I'm going to bring a little yeah, bit yeah, of chaos yeah, yeah. great of chaos in the final third a bit of Ben White but, magic exactly um, but no and I think that's 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 the reason the very reasons that Rob Edwards is saying I think is something that's been uh, I have to admit, I think it's it's not something I thought I would see this Arsenal squad be able to do this quickly. I know it's been a few years under Arteta, but still, Arsenal were. I know you guys have talked about this loads, so I keep but this it was so Arsenal was so far away from being a team that looked like they could do this. Mm. Yeah, they've they yeah there's been some really big investment, but also this is you can't do this without coaching. And I remember Xhaka saying something. 
uh, about Arteta saying he's like a freak. He's a complete freak, but in the in the best way, you know, mm. the way that he tactically thinks about it. And he's gone to Leverkusen now, and I think he's experiencing something very similar with Jabi Alonso. And it's really interesting when you see these players buy into something that actually involves quite a lot of discipline, quite a lot of boring stuff. Kai Havertz, I think, is a major part of that. I, I don't think he's... It's just really interesting now, I think, that there isn't really any talk about Kai Havertz in terms of whether he should be playing, whether he shouldn't be playing. I mean, is he it's not the just, perfect example of, of a, a guy, You know, when you referenced earlier, this team developing in ways that we didn't necessarily imagine or think about that yeah. his his influence and maybe his importance is not necessarily something that people would have envisaged like i think the discussion was always like well we you know once he starts getting some goals and assists then we can properly judge him as a player or or this is yeah. how we're going to properly judge him as a player but i do think that he is like a, a sort of <sighs> tactical joker in a way for Mikel Arteta yeah. because of all that stuff that Tom Lockyer is talking about and the work that he's doing and the way that he's running and, and, and what that, what that does to the opposition as well as being able to contribute. He got an assist last night. He's been in good goal scoring form. You know, I think he is somebody who is, uh, you know, you could hold him up as not quite a poster boy for where the team is going, but as like, if you'd said to people at the start of the season, Havertz is going to be basically a first choice player and the team will be better with him in it. They'd say, you know, go home, you're drunk. That sort of lark, you know? I mean, I think when the signing was made, part of me would have hoped that because he was someone that we, uh, Moose and I hugely admired when he was at Leverkusen. I talk about a game I went to see him play against Hertha all the time, which was a behind closed doors game. And I just watched him for 15 minutes and he was never not in five yards of space and the the ability that it takes to be like that. Mm. You always hope that he could, he could do it. Um, I think when Mikel Arteta showed such faith in him early on in the season, when he kept playing him, even though everyone was kind of being like, Oh, he keeps missing chances. He keeps doing this. You knew that he, he was, he was delivering in other ways and he was like, you see the amount of defensive work he does. He's completely integral now in the way that Arsenal want to play. Um, and yeah, I think that is a major factor in why Arsenal mm. probably restricts teams so high up the pitch, you know, in the Sheffield United game away, I would say, cause I was, I was sat behind the goal and especially in the first half, like, the the ball i don't think the ball even like came 50 year uh, 50 yards near us because as soon as arsenal lost the ball they won it back again and everything was up the other end all mm. the goals all the action everything and and you're thinking like wow this is relentless and this isn't the first team arsenal have done this to and they can do it anywhere over the uh, in any parts of the pitch and that must just be exhausting and i think city mm. struggled a little bit even though they had all of the ball in arsenal's final third there was that stat about the touches in the opposition box and how, you know, Arsenal had had more after like 20 minutes or something. So they couldn't really penetrate. And I think this is something that has been Arsenal's biggest um, development, maybe in terms of a, a, a something that is building an aura. Arsenal had to rebuild their aura, right? And I think when, when the aura or the vibe becomes that... Um, Put it this way, any team playing Arsenal, no matter how good or bad they were, knew that they were going to get chances against Arsenal mm. years ago. They just knew that they would get chances. They knew they'd get opportunities. If the reputation is that this team gives you nothing, that 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 hurts when you're not getting anything. And it becomes this, you know, the, the thing about... Um, Self-fulfilling look, prophecy in a way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And looking over and seeing all these absolute units in the in the in the tunnel before and it all puts together this this puzzle or this picture of an of the opposition that you're kind of like oh, we don't really have a chance today mm. and that is something that takes time to build and i think that arsenal have probably achieved that in a more rapid fashion than i thought they would yeah um and whether arsenal win anything this season or not it's kind of that's it's not really the point because I feel like, I mean, it is the point if you obviously you want to win stuff, but I mean like analyzing how good this team is. 
I don't think can be done purely on whether Arsenal win the league, for example, because there's three really good teams. There. Sure, of yeah. course. I think I think everyone will understand that, that you can yeah. separate your final position from who you are, what you do, how you do it, and, and what yeah, you're capable yeah. of. Before we just move on to, I just want to talk a little bit about left back, and that is mm. a, a development situation. I, I, I want to give a, a shout out. We talked about the players who came in and who had their chances. You know, I think all of them uh, did okay. You know, Smith Rowe, we've talked about the others, I think useful minutes for them and, and everything else. But there's some mainstays in that team around whom you know, so much revolves and who are so important. We even saw Declan Rice get a bit of time off last night, um, you know, in part because you need to give uh, a start to Thomas Partey and that's where it's kind of where he, he's going to play. But he played a lot during the international break and mm. you know, he got some minutes off. But so did Martin Odegaard. Martin Odegaard played a lot during that international break and in the yeah. 92nd minute, he's chasing around, he's sprinting, he's closing down. He is, you know, the archetypal lead by example kind of captain because if you're looking at, at the physical effort that he puts into every single game, you can't shirk your responsibility if you're one of his teammates and he's your captain doing that and he's running hard in the 92nd, 93rd minute. But also Ben White, another 90 plus minutes. Saliba, Gabriel. Um, I'm going to exclude David Raya because, you know, another clean sheet. But I, I think if there is a golden glove and it goes to David Raya, he needs to, you know, give a finger to Saliba, a finger to Gabrielle, a finger to Ben White, you know, <laughs> that I think a lot of his clean sheets have come because he really hasn't had a huge amount to do. But those guys right. in particular last night, you know, did it all against Manchester City on Sunday and they're there again. And as much as we talk about squad depth, as much as we talk about being able to rotate players in and out and see these players come in and contribute in a positive way. You can't do it with 11 players. You've got to have these these guys who are the mainstays, the anchors, the supports, the 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 pillars of your team and and those four I think last night were absolutely superb in that respect. Yeah, I think that's a major difference between this season and last season. We've just got a really settled defensive unit that knows each other really well has had another year of playing I mean David Rye is new into that but I'm talking about obviously the Gabriel Saliba Ben White plus one um they're so important and the good thing is for me is that they've never really looked tired there was a moment I think uh before Arsenal went to Dubai where Ben White just got caught a couple of times like on his heels, really, really minor stuff that most of the time wouldn't be punished. And there was a couple of goals I think Arsenal conceded at home. Um, and it, you know, I think two in three weeks or something might have been because Ben White could have closed down a little bit more. Since that's happened and Arsenal had that break, there's been, I, I can't think of anything he's done wrong. I literally cannot think of an error. And that I'm sure there will be somewhere, but he is so. He is so unbelievable. I just don't. I I don't want to fanboy too much because, uh, you know, I know that then you kind of you 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 accidentally form these biases around those players. But I think he's my favorite Arsenal player. I think we might have said this last time I was on the show. I think he's my favorite Arsenal player, and I think that's just because of the whole Benjamin White experience. You know, and if he was if he wasn't actually that good, and he was a bit more cult heroy. Mm. Like most cult heroes don't actually tend to be that great. Yeah. And I think he's a he's a a bit of a unicorn in that sense is in the the fact that in the in this era of all of these England right backs there isn't a game going by at the moment where com any commentator is just like please come back to like please come back to England <laughs> Ben please come back which 18 months ago just wasn't a thing because everyone was just like, oh, we've got so many right backs, it's fine. Mm. Um, so many right backs were playing a load at left back as well for England. So, yeah, I just love him. And I think that they're, they're a really important part. If you look, if you think compared to last season, losing Saliba, losing Tommy Asu in that sporting game at home, mm. that was the that was the killer, really. It I was, was at that yeah, game yeah, with yeah. Tyo and it was just a bad, bad evening all around. You know, mm. losing those two, seeing that goal 
go in, it was just a bit like, ah, oh. you kind of felt the, moment, the momentum of the season change that night. Mm. I think what Arsenal have done this season is injury-wise, results-wise, performance-wise, we, we're pushing that, or we're, we're reducing the amount of chances of having one of those games because we're getting deeper and deeper into the mm. season. You know? Sure. I, I also think, and I'm throwing this out there to any musicians who might be listening, there needs to be a jazz combo called the Ben White Experience, please. It really does. Somebody, yeah. somebody sort that out. Right, finally, um, you know, we're delving into the realms of speculation and stuff here, but, mm. you know, there was a lot of discussion. I saw a lot of discussion about Alexander Zinchenko last night and his performance, yes. and again, it's one of those where you have to say, hasn't played a lot lately, Um there were some good. I mean, when I look at the stats in this game, he made five clearances. Some of his defensive positioning was really good in our box. Only Gabriel made as many clearances. Um, Zinchenko with two tackles, which was as many as any other Arsenal player. Two interceptions, which is as many as other any other Arsenal player. And yet there were moments. There were moments where you're like, what this, you know... And I don't necessarily want to dwell on him too much, but I'm I'm thinking about the development of the team and where it goes and, and how we maybe go in a direction or, you know, because all the talk is like striker, winger, who are we going to get to replace this player, you know, in the four? I get it. I understand. I think those things are necessary. But I do wonder if part of what we might do during the summer is is look at the left-back position because – you know, is Zinchenko a nailed-on first-choice starter in that position? No, I don't think he should be. Is no. Kivior? No, he's done well and fair play to him, but I don't think he's a he's a guy who who um, should be starting most games for you. Tommy Asu, I love him, but again, again, no, yeah, no, yeah. not your first-choice left back. There's a discussion maybe to have about Urian or Jurian Timber. Maybe he's that guy. My sense is really that he is um, hes somebody who, who probably should and will ease the burden on Ben White because as much as we talk about him and as much as we talk about what he's capable of doing, I, I do think there is a limit to how much you can ask of Ben White and to have Timber as another option on that right-hand side would be absolutely amazing. So... You know, is it within the realms of possibility that Arsenal, when it comes to this summer's transfer window, despite the numerous options that are available to Mikel Arteta at left back, might look at that position as one where a signing could really change the level or lift the level of the team? Yeah, I think either left back or right back, like a specific right back, because I think that the cool thing about this Arsenal collection of defenders is that they're really quite flexible. If there's a problem at right back, you could push Ben White. In, oh, sorry. If there's a problem at centre back, you could put, push Ben White into centre back if you needed to. If you have a right back option, if Timber's there, Timber can play right back. Tommy Asu as well can play right Tommy back. Tommy Asu can play back, right yeah. back, left back, or centre back. Mm -hmm. Kivior can play centre back or left back. Timber can play all across the back line when he's fit. So. I think it's interesting. I think with Sinchenko, just to start with him before like the options, I think that he is just an example of the thing that we were just talking about, what was really cool that Rob Edwards said. So Arsenal can hurt you in different ways or play different ways. Without if you take Sinchenko out of that squad, that is a you're slightly reducing uh the ability to ask for Arsenal to be flexible. I think what we have to also remember is that we're not even at the end of the second season of Zinchenko and Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. So when they when they when they signed and they played, we were just like, "Wow, Zinchenko gives us this dimension that we have just never had." Look at the way that he's all of a sudden in midfield and he's kind of inverting, and we loved the fact that we could now have uh, an inverting fullback properly, and. The defensive issues were, they were there then as well. And I think that just because we'd seen a very real level up all of a sudden, we were a little bit, um, you know, we we, ign we, were, we were cool with ignoring some of the defensive stuff because we weren't really expecting a title push. I think that this, 
the season is long, right? And for example, if you look at the starting eleven that has been that played against Manchester City, then you compare that to what Arsenal thought or what Arsenal started with earlier on in the season. It it makes you understand how seasons can evolve and how 11s can evolve and how you're going to need to be adaptable. I think Zinchenko might not be starting games next season. I don't think he will. But I don't think by any means he will be sold or anything like that. I don't think the team has moved on, <laughs> like or moved past him. I think that he, the team has evolved that he might be a closer as opposed to a starter. He might be brought on to show just just to play midfield, actually, not to invert. Another ball playing midfielder to keep possession, circulate possession in games that Arsenal need to just see it out mm. or start games at home against the bottom six. You know? Yeah. They're just important. That players like that are just as important as people who are going to start away to the champions because you need to give people rest. And I think what we would, what we've had a real problem with in the last, however long, you know, you talked about raising the floor earlier. That's a major part as, you know, as much as raising the ceiling, raising the floor is such a massive part of squad building because you have to be able to af- afford to give people like Declan Rice a rest or Saka a rest. And we haven't been able to do that before because the drop off mm-hmm. has been too steep. So, we always know there's a risk reward thing there with Zinchenko. This anyone listens to this podcast is not that's not going to be new information. You guys talk about that a lot. And I think that all I would say is that, you know, we're gonna need players like that at points. We might need him deep into the Champions League. We might need him deep into this title run. Um I think he's still while there are obviously issues and moments at home to loot and I think he's still got a major role to play in this squad. Um, and then just quick, sorry, I know that's been a huge monologue, but in terms of a left-back thing, I think it's, I think a lot of that will just depend on Timber because that thing that Arteta said about him this week, about um, mm. him possessing qualities that basically like no one else in that back four has, I, I think he was probably a major, major factor or was going to play a major role at left-back this season. Yeah, maybe so. I'm very curious to see what those things that he has that Ben White doesn't have, that Sinchenko doesn't have, that Saliba doesn't have, that Gabriel doesn't Maybe. have, that Tommy Asu doesn't have. What what's you know, what magic qualities does Jurian Timber have in his back pocket that we hopefully will be able to see between now and the end of the season? It's exciting. Maybe it's actual magic. Maybe, Maybe so. Yeah. Maybe so. He just Look, vanishes and all of a sudden he's like twenty he yards further up the pitch. <laughs> like, what the hell? With the ball and everything. Fingers exactly. crossed. Exactly. Incredible. Fingers crossed. All right. Look, we had better leave it there. As ever, pleasure to talk to you, Ryan. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much indeed to Ryan. You can find him on Twitter. He is at Ryan Hun, at Ryan Hun. And if you fancy a bit more Ryan in your ears, subscribe to the Stadio podcast, which he co hosts alongside Musa Akwanga. And you can hear him on Righty's House as well. So if you'd like a Hun overload, we've got you covered. Okay, with me now to talk a little bit about what has become an annual tradition uh, from our friends at the Arsenal Vision Podcast. It's Elliot Smith. Hello there. Yeah, good to talk to you. I feel like whenever I come on here, my goal is to to try to be clever and funny and a smart ass in some way or another, but this isn't really the subject matter for that, is it? <laughs> no, not really. Not really. You'll have other opportunities to do that. Um, we're here to talk about uh, the amazing stuff that, that you do for the the Arsenal Foundation, the fundraiser. This is what, the third or fourth year now, is it, maybe? I think this is the fourth year. This is the fourth year. Raising funds for for the Arsenal Foundation. Like, if people aren't aware, just sort of an overview of what the Arsenal Foundation are doing and what you're trying to raise funds for. Yeah, absolutely. So the Arsenal Foundation is obviously a charitable arm uh, of Arsenal Football Club, and they take donations that are given by people like us, regular Arsenal supporters, and put it to good use. And the project that they've really nominated to pour their heart and soul into is called Coaching for Life. Mm -hmm. It's a program that they run where they essentially take lessons they've learned from what Arsenal and the community does in North London, right? So Arsenal community uses football and coaching football and programs with young people to help try to get them back on track in life and help lift them out of challenging situations. They've taken that and transported it to places uh, outside of London. In this case, specifically, the Zattery Refugee Camp in Jordan, which is on the Jordan-Syrian border and houses 80,000 Syrian refugees. Um, Over half of them are children. 
right? So over 40,000 children living in conditions that are quite difficult. And I had the privilege of going to the Zattery refugee camp last year, seeing the conditions there, seeing the challenges that these kids face, gender-based violence, child marriage, uh, child labor, and, and other issues that they're confronting. And what the Coaching for Life program really does, Andrew, is it provides them safe places they can go first and foremost to be kids, right? To play mm -hmm. football, which we know the power of football in transforming young people's lives, but it, it gives them that. But then within those confines, it also, they have resiliency programs that also teach them life lessons, the importance of staying in school, getting them out of these challenging um, positions they may find themselves in, teaching them resiliency skills where they can stand up for their rights. The program has remarkably achieved gender equality as well. So there's as many girls now participating as boys. And I get to hear from some of these girls um, and their moms and some of the boys and their dads and hearing about how the program has dramatically changed their lives. One of the things that I think we take for granted is having friendships, people in our life that we can come to depend on, you know, like, like I think about you, people <laughs> that you can lean on in a tough moment, sure. right? Who can be there for you. In the refugee camp, those kinds of relationships are very hard to come by. And so you often feel very alone and isolated and confronting challenges. The Coaching for Life program gives them friendships and allies and people that help stand up for them. They learn to stand up for themselves. They learn to be able to just be kids again. And really importantly, by connecting to Arsenal in North London, they feel part of the wider world because the problem with a refugee camp is that it is so isolating and it makes you feel that the world has forgotten you, that you have no connection to the world. And so Arsenal for them, however much we think it means to us, for them it is their lifeline to the wider world. So mm. that's a really long uh, monologue, I realize. But um, it is it is such a profound project that – the Arsenal Foundation has taken on there and, and such an impactful one. Sure. I, you have an interview um, out now that people can either listen to uh, on the Arsenal Vision podcast or they can go and watch on your YouTube channel with Leah Williamson, uh, who was also, um, was also visited there. It was interesting to hear you talk about life in a refugee camp and how that can become, you know, all these amazing things that are happening within that space. But at the end of the day, it is a refugee camp for people who are displaced and people who have nowhere else to go. But I thought it was really interesting to hear Leah talk about what you just talked about, how these kids connect to Arsenal and how they connect to North London. So I'm just going to play a little clip here from that. People can go and watch the full interview on YouTube and listen to it on the Arsenal Vision podcast. So this is when you asked her about her thoughts on seeing how these kids connect with, with Arsenal. Honestly, it, it broke my heart in a way because it was so pure, like pure um, yeah. Yeah. and genuine, their love for Arsenal and how, how connected they do feel to it. Um, I, I had this conversation with with people that I went with and when I came back when I was reflecting on it, but you genuinely, you know, you take a football club halfway across the world and you still have the exact same feeling that I have when I talk about Arsenal here or when I visit the community hub here. Um, you know, like it's the, I don't think you, it's, it, I mean, most football fans would say this about their clubs, I presume, but when you play for Arsenal or you're a fan of Arsenal or you just live in the community, you understand that it's just a bit different and it has always felt different to me. And like I say, maybe everyone else thinks that about their own situations, but the way Arsenal have always done things and been such a community um, sort of based club, the fact that you can feel it when you get over there just honestly blew my mind because you don't, you don't know. I don't know if they just, we hand out kit or um, <laughs> but I was so happy to see that, yeah, they and they almost, you know, the way they talk about Arsenal is is with love. It's not just as a this is a partner that that comes in. You know, there's lots of partners in the camp. There's lots of things going on, but the way they talk about Arsenal, yeah, they they feel a part of it, which is really important to me because we don't just go there to to drop in and leave. We we go there to give them a sense of belonging. And, and you know, this is what it is, right? That this connection is not just for to help them through a difficult couple of weeks. This is a connection that they're going to have for the rest of their lives. And, you know, we live now in a very global world. And I think, you know, doing what we do, we have listeners and readers from all over the world. Arsenal has fans all over the world. And I think that is something that you can you can stay true to the to the roots of who you are in the community in which you're based, but still have an impact, you know, thousands of miles away. 
Yeah, certainly. And and first and foremost, Arsenal in the community still exists. It goes on. There is great work mm. being done in North London um, by Arsenal in the community. Freddie Hudson uh, helps run that program, and he is a marvel. I think there's a couple points I want to make that, that touch on what you just said, Andrew, that are really important. Firstly, there are unfortunately thousands of heartbreaking circumstances all over the world, um, situations mm. that shouldn't exist, people living through conditions that no one should confront. And it can be hard to explain why any one situation deserves more attention than any other. Unfortunately, I think that can have a chilling effect on, on doing anything because it can feel hopeless. So the first thing you have to do is say, I'm going to pick something. Well, Arsenal picked this and we're Arsenal supporters. I had the chance, as I said, to go out there and see it. Good work is being done and there are children that have a need. So you say, you know what? I'm going to do this. Once you tell those children, we're going to show up for you and we're going to make an impact in your lives, you absolutely cannot then say, well, okay, I did that. Now I'm going to go do something else. Those children come to depend on this program in so many fundamental ways for their lives to have any chance for success. So while I totally understand that it can be very difficult to focus on any one circumstance. Mm. I feel really good that we've we've identified this this group of of very uh, deserving children that we've shown up for them and that we're going to continue to show up for them. Because once you make a promise to kids, I think at that point you have to live up to it. You know. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Look. You know. You could you could pick a thousand causes and a thousand things that you could devote your time to and, and spend your money on if you were so inclined. So, um, you know, this is here for people who want and can and have the ability to help if they can. Um, you're doing the fundraiser. Um, mm -hmm. It is via uh, just giving. But, but you know, what is there above and beyond, you know, the good feeling that you're going to get from helping sure. these children? You know, part of it is to, to sort of draw people in and, and to... I think, uh, you know, from our experience, I think both of our experience um, is that the Arsenal community, certainly uh, the ones around which we revolve or, um, you know, which we're involved in are incredibly generous and thoughtful and giving and willing to contribute. And I know not everybody listening to this will be able to, but if you can, you know, um, maybe just explain what else is on offer um, beyond the charitable endeavor and beyond the great work that Arsenal are doing. Yeah, sure. And you've said something really fundamental there. Obviously, not everyone can give. And this is something you do if you're able, yeah. right? O and only if you're able. Um, so you can go to the Just Giving site, which is justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash AVP. But I'm sure it'll be in the show notes or you can find it on social media. It'll yep. be all over the place. But uh any donation of any amount enters you to win a VIP ticket uh, in the Arsenal um, rewards box for the Bournemouth game, our second to last home game. And as of time of recording, that looks like it could be a very important fixture indeed. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who went to the Bournemouth game last season, I hope it doesn't resemble that one at all, <laughs> although I'd take it if I had to at a pinch. Um, and if Reese Nelson wants to reproduce his heroics, that's that's fine as well. Um, so you can win that. That'll be drawn at the end of April. So there'll be you know time to know that you're going. It doesn't include travel if you have to travel there, but it does include food and drink, participation in the Breakdown Live, a chance to meet Clive and Tim from our pod who will meet you there, um, and a chance to be in a VIP box for an Arsenal game, which is great. If you say, you know what, I have the means and I'd like to give more, but I'd also like to get a VIP box ticket, um, there are a few other tickets in that box that we are auctioning on an auction site, which... If you go to the Just Giving page, the link to that auction site is available to you as well. As of t at time of recording, there are still a few of those left. Um, that, again, is only if you have the means and, and you really feel the, the sense of generosity to contribute. But either way, uh, you're supporting a phenomenal cause. I can't thank you, Andrew, enough for the platform to come here and talk about it. And your f phenomenal philanthropic endeavors are well documented, giving you know, what you've given in April is extraordinary. So kudos to you. And, and we're obviously giving to this as, as well. So um, if anybody has any questions too, I'm always available, whether it's on social media or email or however you want to reach out, I'm happy to answer them. Mm, okay. 
you know, this idea of Arsenal as a global club, I think is quite funny, really. You know, I'm an Irish guy who started a website about Arsenal while I was living in Spain, came back to Dublin, and you're an American guy, and, and you know, this football club. Is it club, that obvious? Just a little bit. You know, I know you do your best. <laughs> do your best to hide your accent, mate. Um, but, you know, th- this football club and what we do has kind of uh, brought us together a little bit. I just wanted to ask you, you know, when when you're fortunate enough, I think, as as we are, to have the kind of platform that we have, to have the kind of audience that we have, and and the wonderful people who listen to us, who read us, who support us on Patreon, who enable us to do what we do week in, week out. You know, it certainly feels to me that it is incumbent on us to try and give as much back as we can or give a bit back. Because, you know, our lives are incredibly, um, I don't want to use the word privilege because sometimes there is like a, a connotation with that. I don't mean it in that way. But I think, you know, in comparison to some of the people who are in the refugee camp, that is objectively true, right? How about and, fortunate, you know? Fortunate, yeah. But a quirk of fate, a quirk of, you know, mm-hmm. place of birth or whatever it might be that, you know, our lives are just so completely different from from their lives, but it does feel important to me that we are able to harness the the, the size of the community, the goodwill of the community, and, and just the, the decency of the people who are around and who are Arsenal fans, you know, to try and make a small difference. It's a drop in the ocean. We know it's a drop in the ocean, but I, I really do think it's important. So to that point, let me announce one thing, actually, that I intended to do earlier uh, in our conversation. To, to your point, the remarkable solidarity of this community, your podcast community, our podcast community, the Arsenal community, to respond to this call for help. It just blows me away. And to that point, we've had someone offer to donate up to 150,000 pounds to match every single pound donated up to 150,000 pounds. So for every pound you donate, a second pound is being donated by this person. For every 10, 50, 100, an additional 10, 50, 100 is given. If you give 50, you've given 100 because this person is going to give 150,000 pounds to match everything up to wow. that amount. So just again, we are we are building something special that is going to leave a legacy and we can be proud of that legacy. Um, and we will see it not marked in days, but certainly marked in years in the lives of these people that that are made better by what we do. Amazing. Amazing. And thank you to that person for their Mm. incredible generosity. Um, All the links that you need to get more information about the the fundraiser are in the show notes. Uh, The auction link, everything is in there. You know where to find Elliot on Twitter if you haven't already blocked him. He is, of course, the host of the Arsenal Vision podcast, which I'm sure most of you listen to anyway. Um, We'll talk soon. We've got another announcement to make, of course, ourselves about a little traditional end of year get together so people can keep an ear out for that but for now elliot thank you very much always wonderful to see you thanks andrew thank you so much to elliot you can find him in all the usual places on twitter at yankee gunner and of course details of the arsenal vision fundraiser can be found at arsenalvisionpodcast.com or you'll find links in the show notes uh, in this particular episode which will take you there it is an incredible cause the arsenal foundation do incredible work so if you are in a position to help in any way every donation regardless of how big or small would be massively appreciated by elliot the arsenal vision crew by me and of course by the arsenal foundation as well and as you know We're also doing our bit here at Ars Blog, as well as supporting the fundraiser. In the month of April, we are going to donate every single penny that we generate via our Patreon subscriptions to UNICEF to help children around the world who are affected by conflict, by famine, by disease. And that money will go directly to the relief efforts in that regard. So if you want to sign up for our Patreon, you get instant access to all of the content that we do on Patreon. Tomorrow, for example, we're going to have an episode of The 30. We'll also do our Premier League preview podcast for you, looking ahead to the Brighton game. So you get instant access to that. But you know that this month in April, your subscription is going to a fantastic call. So if you'd like to sign up, it's patreon.com forward slash arseblog. That's patreon.com forward slash arseblog. Okay, let's leave it there for now. As ever, thank you so much indeed for being with us. Hope you enjoyed the show. Take it easy and we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye.
actually Benjamin. Why? It's my name. My mom gave it me. Don't even get bullied. Bullied. Benjamin. Benjamin.